Okay, uh, I'm a PhD student uh, from University of uh, South Florida, and uh, this is my project. Okay, uh, for this product, we are using the character mucilage, character mucilage as a dispersion uh, for the spilled oil, and uh, so for the, with this character mucilage, we uh, we test the surface tension, and also we test the toxicity, and also the droplet size of the dispersed oil. So that's what we did in this project. It, this is a new research on the, yeah, use as the dispersion, I mean, for the spilled oil. So this is a new project. Because for the chemical dispersion, most of the chemical dispersion has the um, toxicity potential, I mean. But for this one, this is the bio material. It's the characters is a food resource. So it's uh, totally non-toxic. So I'm a master's graduate student. Um, I'm in a College of Charleston program, but my lab is the Medical University of South Carolina, and I work under Satomi Kono and Dimitri Sparopoulos. So basically, I'm investigating uh, Corexit and if it has any endocrine disrupting potential, specifically as an estrogenic compound. Um, and I'm answering this question both using um, transactivation assays, which the method is shown here and some of my results, um, to look at it in vitro, but also using the American alligator as a model system. Uh, so the reason that we use alligators is because of their temperature-dependent sex determination system. Um, so their sex is determined by temperature, but it's also strongly influenced. But if the eggs are exposed to an estrogenic compound, you will have sex reversal, um, or the sex ratios will be skewed towards females, even at that male-producing temperature. So over the summer, I carried out a dosing experiment um, and dosed the eggs with different levels of Crexit, including multiple controls. Um, and then now I am analyzing samples um, to both look at sex ratios, but also sexually dimorphic gene expression. Um, and then my next step from here, I'll be using qPCR to look at gene expression, and I might be doing immunohistochemistry in the future with the samples. And hopefully looking also at um, fish receptors, um, fish that are found in the Gulf of Mexico. We're working on studying the potential endocrine disrupting effects of either components in the oil or components of Corexit that were used as a dispersant to clean up the oil spill. And we were specifically looking at trying to identify components that could potentially regulate fat cell differentiation in um, really looking at for human health or potentially a wildlife exposure. We identified a component in Corexit, which is DOS, dioctyl, sodium sulfosexinate, which you hear a lot about at the um, oil spill conference pretty much, but we identified DOS as being an activator of this receptor and contributing to fat cell differentiation in vitro. The other respect is that DOS is used in a lot of other household sort of products and different, it's primarily used as a laxative, so human exposure could actually be more relevant, not in an oil spill scenario, but just through other um, daily activities. So this is sort of shedding light on um, a compound that really hadn't been looked at for this type of assay before. Well, what we're trying to show is what the oil looks like to a chemist uh, from 2010 through uh, 2014. So what, what, how the oil has changed as it come ashore and gets degraded. So we, we, we have a variety of pictures that the chemist would use to interpret what happened to the oil. So the data here is the data that chemists see and then we interpret that to say this is where the oil is, what's left of it, how it's changing, what it's profit. When oil comes ashore, it causes damage. But the good news is that there, it doesn't stay around. It's some chemicals called persistent organic chemicals, they stay in the environment. Oil is a type of chemical that can be degraded by natural processes, mostly bacteria, in the environment. So it's continually changing and going away. And so basically what we want to do is follow what, what damage it did when it came ashore, and then as Mother Nature cleans the environment up, what, what's the form it takes. 
Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, you know, when it comes ashore, it gets buried and that stops the degradation process. And so basically that's what we, we see here, that over four years, oil has not degraded very much at all in certain small locations. The other data shows how its, its composition has changed over time during the spill. We want to continue following this spill for the next uh, three years to see it's still, still oil there. Uh, we're, this is just part of a, of a much larger process of not just looking at the oil, but looking at the insects in the marsh, the fish at the marsh's edge, uh, the bacteria that are in the ecosystem, and, and how those were impacted and affected by this massive insult in 2010. During the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, there was a, a plume of oil at depth that had somewhat lower oxygen than the ambient water. So people were worried about a dead zone disaster about to happen. Um, there's a natural low oxygen area in the Gulf at about 800 meters, and these anomalies were very small. So the next concern was whether the oil from the Deepwater Horizon might be affecting the annual hypoxia that develops on the Louisiana shelf because of an overload of Mississippi River nutrients. So having at that time, we had now have 30 years worth of data, but at that time having 25 years worth of data before the oil spill and the same sort of data collection during the oil spill, we can compare 2010 with all the other years to see if there was anything significantly different between the years. But when you compare the year 2010 with all the other years, with uh, the amount of freshwater inflow, the nitrate load, the wind direction, the wind speed, you really could not see any difference in the stations from 2010 to all the other years beforehand. So that's not direct evidence one way or the other, it just says that 2010 was not any different. And the oil, uh, only was seen on the surface in this area uh, anyway on the southeastern coast is where we could visibly see the oil and measure the oil and certainly not over the certainly not over the large area where the hypoxia occurred. We now have 30 years worth of data. It may be our swan song because NOAA has no program in development starting this year to support this long-term data set, which would be a real, in my opinion, failure of the system to support something that's so important to the nation. We've collected uh, four years of data on uh, fish assemblages in uh, coastal Mississippi. So we've got uh, trawl data from uh, summers of 2011 to 2014. And so we're looking for changes in uh, assemblage properties. Um, uh, when we compare 2011 and 2014 to pre-DWH data. So at the most fundamental level we're asking how uh, fish assemblage has changed in response to the oil spill. So things as simple as uh, what species are present, uh, what kinds of abundance patterns do we see, levels of biodiversity. Um, so the public generally recognizes the value of fisheries, and so this is a simple metric of the health of the fisheries pre and post oil spill. I think we're, we're probably wrapping it up, so we have four years of data, and then we compared to, uh, let's see, eight years of pre-oil spill data. So this is really kind of a synthesis, kind of, I think we're pretty much done with the project. Um, and I think it, it turned out pretty well. Um, this poster is a summary of our work in what we have done in EcoGig and the EcoGig 1 consortium. It shows the three main sites, OC26, AT357 and GC600, our AUV dives we have done with Eagle Ray and with Mola Mola, our two under autonomous underwater vehicles. It shows the 
Bathymetry, 3D rendering of bathymetry with uh, sub-bottom profilers, data underneath. It has different resolution images in here. It has a 50 meter dives, it has 25 meter dives, and again, a 50 meter dive here. And we have um, basically a rendering, a 3D rendering of GC600 showing sub-bottom data. And with the, the mega plume, with its hydrate, it's a methane plume coming out of the ground. It's in the center part showing the top view of this area. So it gives us an overview of where we were involved in with EcoGeek at this point. Uh, this type of work was done to give our consortia possibilities to find sites where the best sites are to locate their deep sea landers, to go guide ROV dives, to find the um, possible extension to the existing coral sites they have that we would expand it out to see that they are similar sites. And this is basically what we have done, so for EcoGeek 1. And EcoGeek 2 at this point does not contain any EUV surveys. What was done was done in between. So we are currently not working with EUVs in EcoGeek 2. We are working on a different aspect in EcoGeek 2. Well, let me first begin by saying that these are actually posters of my PhD students. And so we have a cohort of about 2,600 women who lived in the seven southeast parishes of Louisiana that were most affected by the oil. And what we were interested in this particular poster was the relationship between oil spill exposure and psychological distress. And we characterized um, oil spill exposure by both um, actual exposure and economic exposure, so physical and economic ex exposure. And what we found was that while there was a relationship between the exposure and the distress, most of it was um, through low social support. So what that means is that women who have a lot of high social support, meaning they have people to call in case of an emergency, they have people to lend them money in case of an emergency. This is not an economic thing. This is, are the women connected and do they have social, do they have a, a, a group of people they, or relatives, friends or relatives that they can contact? So most of the ex people with a lot of social support did not develop psychological distress. That's important because as we try to figure out in the future what we can do to decrease the occurrence of psychological distress is to really try to build up social support in communities around the country who are prone to natural disasters. Well, what we're showing in this poster is one uh, aspect of a, of a larger study of where we're integrating behavioral health care and, with primary care in community health clinics in the areas affected by them. It's also going on in Alabama, in the University of Southern Alabama, Florida, University of West Florida, uh, Mississippi at Southern Miss, and uh, LSU in Louisiana. And our goal is working with the other uh, grow hop members to integrate services so that we take a whole health approach to care of people who live in uh, low-lying areas that have been impacted by the oil spill and routinely impacted by storms. If you notice, these particular, this particular graph is displaying changes in anxiety levels. What's important about this is that both in children, which is your red line, and in the adults, uh, the anxiety levels are staying stable. As anxiety reduces, uh, the affective or emotional side of what uh, is difficult for people is getting lower and they can regain control and their thinking or cognitive side becomes uh, more dominant in helping them problem solve. As that problem solving process emerges, their ability to bounce back and uh, be adaptive in their communities greatly increases. This is where 
work that was conducted as part of uh, sea image research. So we went out and did a lot of uh, long lining to sample various fish that are important fishery species. And we collected a variety of tissues. We collected islands, we collected otoliths, we collected soft tissues, so muscle, liver, spleen, blood, brain, um, heart, muscle. And uh, so what this is illustrating is the potential use of lenses as a new tool for um, isotopic studies. What we know from using otoliths is there's a lack of nitrogen, and you're not able to get enough nitrogen in the otolith to uh, be able to do work like this. Lenses will actually form in layers, and there's a potential to overcome some of the limitations of these other tools by possibly using lenses instead. So this is new research that we are evaluating as a potential um, to overcome limitations of some of the tools that are currently available. So we're still in the early stages, and we are trying to see if this is possibly a new part of the fish that we haven't made use of in this way before. Uh, this poster is looking at batch fecundity and red snapper before and after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So to look at whether or not batch fecundity may have changed uh, as a result of the oil spill, uh, we modeled it based on age and length uh, for the state of Louisiana as well as the state of Florida. Um, now we wanted to model uh, Florida fish as a reference region because even if we see changes in batch fecundity in Louisiana, if we also see changes in Florida, that might indicate you know, a larger population-wide uh, change that's going on. Um, we use a combination of published papers, uh, NOAA, fisheries data, um, data from Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and our own University of Florida collected data. So you can see here um, that we used a power function to model uh, batch fecundity at length and a logistic model to, uh, for batch fecundity at age. And in Louisiana, we can see that there uh, is a significant difference before and after using a likelihood ratio test uh, for both models. And for our power function for Florida, there is no significant difference uh, before or after the oil spill. This uh, study is a, a part of a larger uh, GOMRI grant looking at age and growth before and after the spill of a bunch of species, including red snapper. So that was another reason why we chose the fish. Um, we also uh, keep in mind for this poster that these are you know, preliminary results and that we're gonna be doing some you know, further research in terms of refining these models. So uh, there may be the similar results in the end, but uh, you know, once we're able to process more samples and incorporate into our final models, we'll be able to see. The poster here, I'm trying to understand the influence of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on mercury concentrations in the food web. Uh, I assess different species of fish from the Florida Big Bend coastal region out to uh, the reefs and all the way down to uh, 1,000 meters plus. Um, and we assess these fish for uh, light-stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, and mercury isotopes, uh, as well as mercury concentrations to try to figure out if there was an impact from the oil spill, and, and if so, uh, what exactly that effect has been. Going forward, we definitely need a better understanding of the baseline of these different elements in uh, different habitats. Uh, so the carbon and nitrogen isotope signatures we're finding are um, highly variable depending on which ecosystem we, uh, we look at, which makes certain cross comparisons uh, difficult. So we need a better understanding of uh, plankton and zooplankton uh, and what their light stable isotopes look at to better 
uh, be able to uh, include them in these food web analyses. That base, the, the understanding of the base of the food web is essential to this kind of uh, food web analysis.